a bigger uh, mess bureaucracy wise as far as the, the sea fire went and the Navy. Prior to the war, the, the Navy was looking at what aircraft they needed and, and the, the, the Admiral in charge of the Navy said he could never see the day that anything other than a biplane would land on a, uh, on a carrier. And, and that's what they, they believed until they got very close to the war. And they suddenly panicked and said, hell, we need better fighters. And they did that, sold that in two ways. One was they got fighters from the Americans, which were wild cats, and they converted them, did something to them, they were called marklets in the, uh, in the Navy. And so, so, so they got those. And as well as that, they tried to convert hurricanes and spitfires. They didn't like the hurricane because the performance wasn't that good, but at least they had a big solid undercarriage. And, and they started using spitfires, and the result was total disaster. And there, there was no way to solve that. Uh, but the chief test pilot from uh, Super Marine, a guy named Sir Geoffrey Quill, went to the fleet air arm base to, uh, to see if he could be of some assistance. And they had this big, big base with a, a, a carrier marked down on the, on the runway. And he, he looked at the way they were landing them. And they were coming in from straight behind, from a long way out. And, and, and the, as they got close, they obviously couldn't see a damn thing. And, and they were, the landings were terrible. And he said, well, there's the first problem. He said, you don't land a Spitfire by coming straight into the runway. He said, you curve and, and, and you come in like this. Huh? And then he said, I'll go and show you. So they one of their C-Fires and came around and curved in and landed. And a couple of them tried and it all looked OK. And then the uh, hierarchy in the Navy said, oh, yes, but you can't do that. So you see, in our operational manual here, it says to land on the carrier. You've got to be 400 feet, one mile behind the carrier, directly behind the carrier. So, uh, <coughs> so he said, well, that's not very good. <laughs> yes. Is that working? Yep. Yeah. So, so it's a bit we said, well, this is not going to work. We've got to do it this way. Uh, and uh, some of the other pilots in the Navy agreed with him, and they tried it, and it worked very, very well. Uh, so uh, the hierarchy then said, oh, it might work here on the land, but it'll work at sea. Uh, so Sir Jeffrey said, well, let's get out, out, out to go out and I'll try to land on the carrier and see how it is. Uh, and they said, I oh, yes, no, you can't do that. He said, in this part here and all in the second, so he said, to land on a carrier, you've got to be a Navy officer or a bus on the bus of the ring. Well, let's get him, make him a, a, give him a, an honorary uh, uh, wrangler, whatever it is. Yeah, that's good. No, we can't do that because it's here and there. But in order to have to be in the Navy and have a rank of that above here, you've got to have done the following things. And he hasn't done any of these things. And so, uh, this was a, 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 a showstopper. It got beaten finally when the House of Commons passed an enabling act to grant the Jeffrey Quill, who was an Air Force officer, this is this is young, grant the to get to Quill at the appropriate level of officer, uh, 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 so that you can actually put a little bit of a land off the front of the aircraft down. This is when the Navy was desperate. So you can imagine what they'd be like when they went so desperate. He did that. And he, uh, he wrote a report, which I've got a copy of, of landing on a carrier. And uh, the idea with the carrier was that you crossed over in front of the carrier, well in front of it. Uh, you, you slowed down and before you got anywhere near the carrier, you put the wheels and the flaps down so you could, didn't have anything else to concentrate on. That you came down in the downwind at three or four hundred feet and you turned on the final between 70 and 75 knots and you, you curved around at 75, uh, no, at 70 to 75 knots. And if you couldn't see, you put your head out, you, you had the canopy back and you put your head out the canopy so you could look out the side. And they started doing that and had a little more success, they still lost a hell of a lot of aeroplanes. So. Uh, to me, landing straight in and on a Spitfire 
and do that is something that when I read that I understood. I might say incidentally he commented that the Spitfire was very bad for that sort of landing because it's light and very, it's quite light and very uh, bouncy and flimsy and he said how the American fighters although they landed le faster they were a lot heavier and when you got them set up they tended their momentum tended to keep them very constant where in the Spitfire, as soon as it got a gust, it went up or slowed down or whatever, and as soon as you applied, it, applied a little bit of power, it shot forward, and it was very, very difficult to keep a constant speed, and he emphasised how, how precise that, how precise you had to be flying this thing in order to keep it sort of 70 to 75 knots. I, I've tried out here, it, it, it lands best when it's slow, and at, at above 80 knots, the thing rounds out and it floats forever. At, uh, at 75 knots it's really nice, and at 70, 70 knots it's very floppy, you know, it's, it's, it's not nice at all. So I try to keep it sort of in between 70 and 78 sort of thing, but that's quite difficult to do. Uh, I, <coughs> but, I, but I understood the, this, uh, this landing because I, I'd flown this thing, I was flown a lot, I was landing it well, I'd landed at Ardmore, I'd landed at Ohakia, New Plymouth, uh, for Nua Pai, and these are all 45 metre wide runways. I then had to go in 2009 to the airshow at Masterton. And I, I looked at the, the, the plates for Masterton and the runway there is 1,200 metres long and I thought, yeah, yeah that's no problem. Near the, you know, this is 1,400 but I never used much more than half of it so that's all good. And the weather was good and I go down to Masterton and due to various traffic and stuff, I finished up having to do a long straight in approach. You know, I've done that here on a number of occasions because the Cessnas and things that are pretty undesirable and they get in the circuit. And, uh, <laughs> so you <coughs> and, and have done straight in approaches and it's okay because 45 metres is a big wide runway. And so from well back you can see the runway because you don't have to move much off line and you can see it. And as I got close I couldn't see the damn runway. <laughs> and, <coughs> and then I was sort of coming down and I knew it must be pretty, you know, getting to this area and I couldn't see the runway. And, and I do, what did I do? You know, I did exactly what I would do with the MX. You just yaw across and look out the side. And, and that works in an MX. But in the Spitfire that's three and a half tons, it doesn't work quite as well. And the result was I hit the runway fairly hard. And, and, boy, and that put the aircraft out for, for, for a number of months, I might add. But it was afterwards. I, I, I read an account by Caroline Grace, who was a woman in, in England who has a Spitfire in class. And she, she was answering questions and she said, oh, landing is, is, is a sort of a fraud exercise. Uh, these things are, you, 45 metres is the, is the minimum you should ever try to land in. Uh, and she said, you can do it a little bit less, but, but it's very uncomfortable. Uh, the next time I tried to land on a narrow runway, I was in fact at Wanaka. That's 30 metres wide, and I landed there and I couldn't see the runway and I hit it moderately hard, not dangerously. So I went up the MX and had a little play, and I came back around on the Spitfire, and that's when I stopped trying to land down the centre line. Forget the centre line. What I do now is I come in and I look down the left hand edge of the runway, and I, I land just so the left hand, I'm quite close to the left hand edge, I've got a nice line to land on, and on a, on a uh, 30 metre runway, which Wanaka is, it puts you just over the centre line. But, but at that point you can see and it's all very easy. Uh, so, yeah. <coughs> that was my poor story as far as that's concerned. Have you not flown it yet? No, and I've got absolutely no desire to. <laughs> <laughs> it's an experience and you can't see the runway. Well, it, it, apparently it's even worse because you can't see the runway and you've got these exhausts that are blowing out the flame yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're trying to look past those. I, it, it's obvious to say I was going to talk a bit about air show flying uh, a, a little bit, but the, uh, three weeks ago there was the, the air show, the afternoon air show at uh, Tauranga and they, the advertising said Spitfires at San Sunset. It's a bit of an exaggeration because there was only one Spitfire, but I, early in the afternoon I did a little display and that went well. And the wind was a bit unfortunate too. And then right at sunset, I, I, I took off. And, and, and the sun was getting low and I was getting nervous about this. 
and then the tower held me up for five minutes while they were well, they had a, a, heli a, a rescue helicopter fiddling around. And, and, and so when I finally go, I did my display, and, and you look up into the sun and it's just brilliantly bright. You look down into the cockpit and it's black. And uh, it was just horrible. And I, I, I was very, very pleased to get on the ground alive. <laughs> there, there's a magazine that comes out, News of the Flyer or something. I, I just got a copy yesterday. And, and there's some photographs of that, uh, that air show. And, and, and there's one of the Spitfire coming in and it looks pretty damn dark. <laughs> um, one of the questions they've asked is, what's it like to fly the Spitfire? And it depends what you've ever flown before. But all, all I read were comments by pilots who, who were the RAF who had started to fly this thing in 1938, 39, sort of thing. And and with that, they invariably said what a marvellous aeroplane it was, and a tower, it was beautiful and light, and it was really good at doing aerobatics, and everything was great. I, I got in this thing, and when I started to fly it, I found that it was pretty terrible at doing aerobatics, and it wasn't light at all. <laughs> uh, and it's obviously just what you're used to, because I was used to flying a G202 and an MX2, and I, I was used to going like this, and, and, and rolling at 500 degrees a second. And with a Spitfire, you go like this, and, and you roll at uh, 180 degrees a second or something. It's a hell of a lot heavier. And, and it's going around so slowly, you've got to allow for the air enough dropping in the air. And, and, and then on the G202, you don't you know, you have to worry about altitude because it's, but you know, it's a plan things. It's just it's done. With, with the Spitfire, you've got to plan things in advance. And uh, I might say it's a little bit different when you get a sort of 300 knots or something. It's, it's, it's a much nicer aeroplane to fly. But that, brings us around back to the design of the thing. This aircraft was designed as an interceptor. It was designed to take off out of England, climb to 20,000 feet at high speed, buzz around and shoot a few of the hum, and come back and land. And that's what it did, and that's what it did superbly. The, the aeroplane was designed to perform well at 20,000 feet. I haven't had it at 20,000 feet, but I'm told it doesn't perform.